For topic A 2.3, we're going to talk about viruses today. And viruses are this crazy, somewhat alive, not really alive organism that typically causes lots of problems for humans uh, in the ver various diseases uh, and also bacteria. Uh, but they're really fascinating organisms, if we can call them organisms, that have some really unique features. And in this video, we're going to examine some of those different structures and features that make them so unique. Let's get started. Viruses are non-cellular agents. They're not cells, uh, and they have some very different characteristics than prokaryotes and eukaryotes that we've talked about. And their job, their function is they infect other cells of a variety of different types and essentially take over those cells and reproduce inside of them, and then oftentimes burst out and spread. Uh, they most likely have multiple different evolutionary origins uh, because they share a few different structural features, and their origins, uh, their similarities that they do have are most likely because of convergent evolution, where a similar selection pressure has led to them to develop similar structures. Um, we'll see that in other species as well. Some of their shared characteristics, they are typically extremely small, usually 20 to 300 nanometers in diameter, which is smaller than basically all bacteria. Uh, and they also don't have any structural features, internal structural features, so that's very different than other cells that we've discussed. They also don't have a cytoplasm, which as, as we know is one of the requirements that all cells have. Um, they, this is very interesting, they're a fixed size and they don't grow in size. And so that's an expectation that we would have for cells is that they would get bigger. Viruses don't. They replicate in terms of numbers, but they don't actually get bigger individually. They do have DNA or RNA, and that's essential for their ability to be able to take over a host cell and manipulate that cell. Their actual structural components, what are they made of? Uh, a caspid or a coating of protein. Uh, their external is, is a, a capsule made of protein that basically is enclosing or encasing the genetic material, the DNA or RNA. And they have a symmetrical structure, uh, which is very different from other living cells uh, and, and very unique. Uh, they lack enzymes. Even after they infect other cells, they have very few viral enzymes uh, that are actually produced because it relies on the host for, me, uh, for metabolism. So it's not actually carrying out its own metabolism, it's relying on the host cell. And the only enzymes that are produced are for the replication of the virus material. So, so it's really very few enzymes that are actually being produced, even though it does have DNA and RNA. So some interesting comparisons and structural uh, components if we compare them to prokaryotes, and eukaryotes, typical cells. Viruses are very diverse. There's lots of different types. You're probably familiar with different types of viruses, COVID-19 being uh, probably like the most prominent virus that you're familiar with. Uh, within class, we'll look at some different types of viruses, and I would recommend you doing that on your own if you're not in class uh, to look at different types of viruses and, and what they do and how they survive. Some characteristics uh, of the diversity, some differences that we see no genes occur in all viruses, which is really different than what we've talked about with uh, plant, animal, prokaryote, eukaryote cells, is we have a lot of gene similarity between uh, even different types of species. And within viruses, there's no genes that overlap between all of them. The, the genetic material is also very diverse in that viruses can have DNA or RNA, uh, and it can be a loop, like a, a circular loop, or it can be linear with two different ends. And so that adds to the, the variation between different types of viruses. RNA viruses uh, have protein synthesis that occurs in a couple different methods. One is a positive sense in which the genes are transcribed directly uh, or used directly as messenger RNA, excuse me. Uh, in negative sense, the genes are transcribed to make messenger RNA. So they're actually being transcribed to make messenger RNA. In retroviruses, uh, they make DNA copies of the RNA genes and then transcribe the negative sense strand of DNA to make messenger RNA. We'll talk more about uh, sense strands of DNA when we get to DNA replication a little bit later on. Uh, and then also what makes the viruses diver uh, diverse is how they're enclosed. Uh, typically when the viruses will burst from a cell in a process called LIS, which is to break, uh, the viruses burst out of the cell and then go and spread and infect other cells. Sometimes they can become enclosed in a membrane or covered in a membrane, often phospholipid, phospholipids from the host plasma membrane, uh, and they become in, uh, enveloped. Uh, like an, uh, They have an envelope or a, a coating of that membrane. 
So proteins within the membrane are often glycoprotein, uh, which is a protein that has a carbohydrate attached to it, and it helps to create contact with other host cells. And this is most common in viruses that infect other animal cells. The non-enveloped do not become enclosed in a membrane, and so that's just kind of the opposite. And they then infect typically plants and bacteria cells. Uh, so some differences in the, the, the types of viruses and, and how they manage their genetic material and also their, their coating of envelopes. Viruses have two different life cycles that they can follow. Uh, the type of life cycle that would typically impact plants and animals, infect plants and animals, is called the lectic cycle. And th th this cycle uh, involves the, the viruses actually breaking out of the cells. As the virus becomes more widespread, typically we see the disease or their impact become more and more severe. Uh, in humans and other organisms, we can oftentimes fight off the virus. We use antibodies to be able to do so. Um, and this type of life cycle has two kind of main disadvantages. One, that the virus has to be detached and destroyed, uh, or it may kill the host cell, uh, which is bad for the host. And it can only persist, the virus can only persist if it spreads to another host. So if the host is able to kill off the virus, then it can't continue to spread. Uh, and so that would be a big disadvantage for the virus itself. And so how the cycle works, uh, proteins in the tip of the virus attach to a host cell. The DNA enters through the pores of a virus into that cell. The DNA replicates, the virus DNA replicates, and that viral DNA is transcribed to make viral proteins. Uh, initially, that the, they're used to, to replicate the DNA of the virus and then the actual components of the virus, the head and the tail, the, the portions that transport that DNA around. The components get self-assembled and then each of them have one copy of DNA. And so then you have inside of the cell, the host to sell all of these new viral capsules uh, ready to go. And when the cell breaks, uh, this is during the list process, the viral proteins then make holes in the membranes of the cell, the host cell, and they burst out uh, uh, to infect other cells. Uh, and so as more and more cells become infected, then there's more and more cells with viral proteins and capsules that are then spreading further and further, thus why the disease becomes more and more severe over time. Uh, this is kind of like if you've ever seen the movie Aliens, uh, the, the process of aliens bursting out uh, from their host. So this is the lictic cycle for viruses. The other virus life cycle is called the lysogenic cycle, and this is pretty sneaky. This is, I mean, cool from a nerdy science standpoint, but uh, this is more under the radar than the lictic cycle. And so what happens in this, the viral DNA actually becomes integrated in the host DNA, uh, it, it initially is not causing a rupture and a killing of the cell, of the host cell. Uh, it really actually causes minimal harm and the DNA can remain undetectable. It just kind of is hanging out, waiting. Uh, it's not doing anything. It can be passed from uh, original cell to daughter cells. So it can actually spread throughout the individual organism, not to different hosts, but within the host uh, through cell replication. And, but it's not infecting other cells outside of the host. Uh, it's just within the host. Uh, at some point, then this life cycle, just hanging out, waiting its time, biding its time, it can change to a lictic state by activation of some genes in response to some stimuli, whether that's internal or, or external of the cell. Something happens, there's some stimuli that then flips a, a switch, and it switched from the lysogenic to the lictic cycle, which we just talked about. Uh, and so then that process would allow the, the virus to spread from one host to different hosts. So it's kind of just hanging out, waiting, biding its time until there's some sort of activation. It is possible also for some of the viral genes to be incorporated into the host, uh, particularly bacterial DNA. And this is pretty cool because the, the bacterial DNA uh, that now contains portions of those viral genes, and this then ultimately increases the genetic diversity of the host bacterial DNA. And so it can in, uh, increase genetic diversity and could then lead to some selective advantage for that particular type of bacteria. Where then did viruses come from? That's kind of our next question, just like we addressed with prokaryotes and eukaryotes, where might viruses have come from? Uh, to start, they're more simple in structure than cells. We, we talked about that uh, previously. That would indicate that they may have evolved before cells, prokaryotes, eukaryotes. 
they do have the same genetic information, the same code, but they don't have all of the same genes. They're also parasites. They must have a host to be able to replicate. Uh, because viruses also use genetic code, DNA, RNA, same as other organisms, this suggests that they would have inherited that from LUCA, uh, and it's reasonable to assume then that they have evolved from other cells. And so there's some different um, hypotheses for how this might have occurred. The first is the progressive hypothesis. And this would be the idea that the virus was built by a series of step-by-steps by taking and modifying cell component, components. And a good example of this and how we see this potentially uh, uh, happening is uh, retrotransposons. And what these are, are they are sequences of nucleotides within eukaryotic DNA. Uh, they, they occur in the genomes of eukaryotes and they're transcribed uh, and produced uh, into RNA, messenger RNA, uh, that, and it's translated to be able to make enzymes. So it's a section of DNA that then is used to be able to make enzymes. Those enzymes make more DNA of the transposon by reverse transcription. So they're actually making more DNA from the RNA, and then they insert copies randomly into the cell's chromosome. So it's adding more DNA uh, to the chromosome. It's really similar, this translation process is really similar to producing DNA in a eukaryotic cell. So how does this relate to viruses? Well, viruses we know uh, are, are taking, um, a, a, they're using their genetic information to be able to make more copies. Uh, and so that's similar to this process with retrotransposons of how that's working. And so this is maybe, uh, if we look at viruses being built by a series of step-by-steps, maybe this is how virus, uh, viral DNA can make copies of itself that then are, are inserted into the host DNA. The alternative hypothesis is the regressive hypothesis. And this is almost the opposite of the progressive hypothesis in, in that virus, viruses would have developed from cells in a step-by-step, -step, but in the loss of cell components rather than the gaining or building up of cell components. Um, viruses and bacteria both show variation in their complexity and their self-reliance, how uh, able they are to rely, uh, be, res survive on their own. Uh, some are more similar to bacteria in performing their functions, such as um, making their own en enzymes. Um, viruses are able to do that, while other uh, bacteria are more parasitic in nature, like chlamydia, for example, is very parasitic in nature and is more comparable to some viruses. This would suggest that viruses might have originated from an, uh, a parasitic bacteria by the loss of functions. For example, chlamydia, uh, by losing some of those functions of the bacterial cell, it could have been led to the evolution of viral cells or vi viruses, not cells. Uh, the diversity of then viruses would be explained by the loss of these functions and similarities that we see between different types of viruses could be explained by convergent evolution where selection pressures are causing the, vir uh, the most successful virus variants to become more and more similar due to those selection pressures. The evolution of viruses can be extremely rapid. Uh, in order for a virus or any organism to be able to evolve, there needs to be a change from one generation to the next. And this is very different in viruses than other organisms because, for example, humans, our reproduction time is years, 20, 25, 30 years. Viruses, their life cycle, their generation time can be as short as an hour. Uh, and so in a very short amount of time, it's possible for the virus to change very, very quickly. Um, and what must be present in order for this to happen is genetic variation. And during the process of replication of DNA or RNA, genetic information, mistakes that happen sometimes can lead to changes, a mutation. And sometimes these can be detrimental, but other times they can be beneficial. And so mutations through that replication can increase the genetic variation within the population. If there's variation within the population, then that allows natural selection to be able to take place. And a virus, whether whatever type of organism it is infected, uh, is a very hostile environment. There's a lot of selection pressure because the host is trying to destroy and get rid of the virus. And that creates a lot of selection pressure. If there's lots of variation, then 
only those that are best able to survive are going to survive. The others will be eliminated and won't be able to reproduce and expand. Uh, and so natural selection eliminates individuals that are unable to survive in the environments. And thus all of these factors then allow the, the virus population to evolve very quickly. And we, if you think back to during the COVID pandemic uh, with the different strains of the COVID virus, we saw lots of different variants develop over a relatively short time period uh, over the, the year and a half, two years of where we really saw COVID spreading. Another example is the influenza virus. And this is an enveloped virus. It uses negative sense, single-stranded RNA. And during the replication of the RNA, the, the RNA replicase does not have a proofreading uh, correction method. And so uh, it's, po it's very possible for mutations to happen. There's no correction of any of the mistakes. And this creates a high mutation rate, which then can lead to rapid evolution, as we just talked about. Uh, it does have eight separate RNA molecules. And this is kind of wild, cool. Um, if a host cell is invaded by multiple viruses, those different RNA molecules can mix and make a new combination, uh, can make a new strain. And so this then increases variation. The proteins that act as antigens um, that bind to and release from the host cells, they can be changed by putting together different combinations, thus also changing the different type of strain. All of these things then allow the influenza virus to mutate and to change very rapidly. Uh, and this also then allows individuals to be um, uh, repeatedly uh, contracting the virus. Uh, it's possible for you to get uh, the virus multiple times within the same season or year because it can, it, it can change so quickly. And so when you go and get a vaccine for the flu, uh, beginning of flu season, it contains multiple different strains that usually will, will protect you from many, but because they're continually changing, even if you get the vaccine, you still may uh, contract the, the flu at, at some point because it's mutating and evolving so quickly. Our second example is another that you're probably familiar with, uh, the HIV virus. And this is a retrovirus and it uses reverse transcriptase uh, to convert a single strand of RNA into DNA. And just like we saw with influenza, there's no proofreading during this process. When DNA gets copied, there actually is some proofreading to try to correct mistakes uh, and mutations. In this situation, there's no proofreading. So there's lots of mutations. It allows the, the viral RNA to change frequently and very rapidly, uh, especially in the process that converts cytosine to uracil, uh, uracil in the RNA. There's lots of potential for mutations there as well. Because of that, HIV has the highest known mutation rate of any virus. Uh, and so then it leads to rapid generation of new strains and it makes cr uh, infections chronic. They can, they can continually happen. Um, there's a protein on the surface that's used to bind and enter the host cell and mutations in that gene that are responsible for that protein um, uh, can allow then the HIV to use different types of cells to enter. Um, and so because of that mutation, the HIV virus can affect, uh, infect different types of cells uh, within the host. Also, uh, it's, it's possible for it to become resistant to antiviral drugs. And so this is why it's essential to be able to use uh, multiple different drugs at the same time to be able to try to affect uh, or, or block the HIV virus. And most recently, we're beginning, we're beginning to see more and more effective treatments at blocking or stopping HIV from spreading uh, within the individual, but also from host to host. And so viruses are really unique uh, organisms, if you will, uh, not cells, not prokaryotes, not eukaryotes. They, they take up this kind of um, interesting space within, within biology, and they have some really unique features that uh, make them so interesting to be able to study and examine to see how they affect and infect their different hosts.